Right, so we're joined for Wording Your Attic by, by Miles Hunt. Lovely to see you. Fantastic. Oh, Amazing where, to be with you. Riotous Thank applause you. as per. Where do we join you? Uh, you have joined me in my little house tucked away um, in South Shropshire underneath... Uh, it is actually a mountain because it's, it's called the Long Mind, and Mind, M-Y-N-D, is uh, Welsh for mountain. Um, and I bought this house 25 years ago when the Wonder Stuff broke up. We, uh, we had to split the assets um, and note down everything for the tax man. Anyway, when we closed the, uh, the VAT account on the band, um, my accountant had said to us, the, the band's account, he'd said to us all, Every receipt that you collect, put it away. Every receipt you got, I don't care if it's for a newspaper, some toothpaste, put it away and just give it to me every three or four months. But when somebody tells me to do something like that, I'm going to do something like that. So um, most, of the, most of the money I, I was spending was in the restaurants of North London, I've got to say. Um, but anyway, when we closed the VAT account, it was split, uh, the, what was left was split uh, between the members of the band. And I got something like 63 grand just wow. from it. It's the only profit I ever made out of the one. <laughs> just out of the VAT. That's <laughs> yeah, just on the VAT. And, you know, we're still <laughs> million in the hole to Polydor. Uh, but, and then the rest of the band hadn't taken it quite as seriously as me. So I, I think one of them had got like two grand coming back to them. And then some bright spark, and this is probably illustrates quite well why the band actually split up. One of them said, well, why don't we just put all of the money in a pot and split it five ways? <laughs> and I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> and I bought this house. It was 49 grand. Stay and, in uh, your bed, yeah. mate. I'll pile in, in Shropshire. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was just, I just wanted it as a little... Um, somewhere to go at the weekends. I intended to stay in London. But then my wife and I broke off. Uh, we, around the same time I bought the house and uh, I thought well I don't know reason to be in London now I'm just going to go and live in it and I've, I've rented a couple of flats in London for you know six twelve months here and there but this is home and I absolutely love it and so during lockdown my life has changed very very little I don't see other human beings you know from this day to the next in normal time uh, I've got my little studio in here. Uh, there's a little campsite shop about two miles away that has wine and fags, which is essentially all I need to survive. And uh, yeah, it's going well. And you've been doing all these lockdown live 2020 things and your lockdown demo society? Yeah, yeah. All of that. I love the lockdown live. It's fantastic. You sort of say playing in, in the, the living room on Wednesday and the kitchen on <laughs> Thursday, studio and back in the kitchen on Friday by popular request or whatever. Brilliant. That's it, yeah. It's a tour of my house. Uh, we're going to do a tour t-shirt for it when, when I do the last one and make those available, do the tour poster that I'll sign. Uh, but I've, I've also been very, very lucky that the last bit of touring I did was November, December, which was uh, connected to the Wonder Stuff's most recent album. Um, and so I think our last date was on 21st or 22nd of December. And I had nothing planned. Oh, right. Um, so I suffered no inconveniences at all. Unlike other musician friends yeah. of mine. I mean, the, the great Ian Prowse was uh, on tour with Elvis Costello. They had to cut that tour short. So um, Ian, you know, had loss of income. The drummer that I'm working with at the moment, um, Luke Johnson, is in... Um, a really rocking band from the US called Low Lives. They were on tour uh, out in Europe and had to cut the tour short. So I've been very lucky. Um, yeah. And one one more lockdown question. You've tweeted a picture of yourself with a, with a can of spam the other day. <laughs> Was it a real can of spam? Are things that bad, that desperate now? <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, I, you know, I could vaguely remember the taste of it. You know, maybe my nan gave me spam when, you know, when I was a teenager. And I just saw it. Like I said, I've got a little campsite shop. And anything I've ever thought of that I'd want to buy from this shop in the last 20 years, like pegs to hang, you know, your laundry out, chalk to write in the chalk, but they got everything. And so I was in there sort of mildly bored one afternoon a couple of weeks ago, and there was spam. And I thought, I'm going to buy spam. I don't know what you'd do with it. So uh, I, I tweeted that picture, but the best thing was, I really enjoyed it as well. I just fried it up, mantle beans. And uh, the best thing was that the spam Twitter accounts, the actual spam, they got in touch with me and said, enjoy my other wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
They've been keeping a low profile all these years, just waiting for everybody to be shot in. <laughs> and spam is going to make a comeback, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah it was very, very enjoyable. I fully <laughs> endorse it. I love the idea of you doing your shopping, not at Tesco or Sainsbury's, but at a local campsite. Yes, yeah. yeah got, I, but, but there's presumably nobody in the campsite, is there? Well, exactly. And I was speaking to a really beautiful local family that have run the shop for years. And I said, um, you know, your takings must be on the up because I was noticing lots more people than normal using the shop. And she explained to me, well, because the campsite's closed, uh, their, their earnings have actually evened out it's, for this time of year. You know, people would have turned up around Easter, so uh, it's all going well for the winter stores. <laughs> is the whole of Shropshire living on Kendall Mint cake, then? Is that what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really understand this. Uh, that's a little further up the road in the Lake District. I think most of the Shropshire survives on the enormous amount of local breweries we've got. Uh, we've got the Woods Brewery, we've got the John Roberts Brewery, uh, there's, there's loads of real ale breweries, you know, spitting distance from, from where I live, and uh, most of us get by on that. All right. Are they still brewing? I think the John Roberts uh, Brewery, which is uh, the oldest licensed brewery in England, right. 1642 it got its license, uh, I think they've stopped. Because, right. of course, ale only has a, you know, a certain shelf life in the barrel. Yeah, right. Well, a mate of mine, when he heard this, he, he went round to the brewery and bought 96 bottles of Cleric's Cure. <laughs> that is panic buying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so have you, Miles, like many of us, sitting at home amongst our souvenirs, have you been reviewing your possessions, particularly of a pop music nature, and thinking, do I need this? How do I, how do I ever end up with this? Uh, you know, well, is it this purpose? I'm quite brutal because my house is tiny, you know, it's just a, an old uh, bungalow barn conversion. So I'm one of those people that will look at something that's sitting in the lounge or in my studio and go, well, if I haven't used that in the last six months, it's out. All oh, right. Um, so, and, and I just, I have a little OCD going on with me. So things have to be just so for me. Um, one of the things that I actually dug out the other day and then when you, you kindly asked me to do this with you, um, Okay, this is this is a berry jiggler. Okay. Oh, what? A Lord. So, so he's he's on a piece of kitchen paper because, right, he jiggles. You see his little tail going there. Right, 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 right. right, right. And this is this was made in 1968 uh, by the, uh, the the berry uh, toy company in the states. It's got a little mark somewhere on his ass that tells me this. All right. Um, but they, the jigglers were a victim of their own success. They were, they were made really for adults to hang from the, uh, you know, the rear view mirror in their cars, but children quickly hooked onto them. Uh, and they became very, very successful in the United States until it was discovered that the, <laughs> I've written this down, the substance that the Berry company made these out of <laughs> called Quiverall. Now, <laughs> If that ain't the name of my next band, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not only highly toxic, but it's also flammable. So if I put a light to this, it would apparently go up. So they, they came off the market pretty sharpish. But, so the reason I keep it, so this is 1968. If, right. if you put this on a piece of paper or a piece of wood, it is still secreting. <laughs> it was stained, whatever you put, which I just think is marvellous. So he's only two years younger than me, but he's he, much like myself, he's still secreting. So but <laughs> he was given the reason I have this is um, in, in the late 90s, I spent at least two years touring acoustically around the United States. Uh, amazing times. And one of the, the trips, so we, we would hire a, a van or a car. We almost bought an old school bus, American school bus, which <laughs> seemed very romantic uh, to drive around America in that for two months. But then we went and looked at it and we were like, you know, I can't sleep in this thing. So uh, I, I did the one to, with a dear friend of mine called Michael Ferentino. Uh, he's from New Jersey, another musician. And what we would do is each town and city we would get to, we would ask where the mom and pop record shop was. 
And the thing that we enjoyed, because our drives were enormous, you know, sometimes we were having to do 500 mile a day. And uh, uh, the thing, rather than look for records to turn each other on to music that he knew that I didn't, we, we decided to go to the, the bit in the CD racks where there were various records, so compilation albums, uh, preferably independent and as current or contemporary as we could get. And we discovered this um, uh, a, a record label called Kill Rock Stars from uh, Seattle. Right. And we bought their, their first of their samplers. And on it was a track by a guy called Mike Sport Murphy, which we were like, well, this is just the guy's name. This is gold, you know, Sport Murphy. This is brilliant. And the track was called Slay and Eat. So it's a, it's a hunting song. Um, and it, it, very, very Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. And uh, I think at the end of the song, there, there are three guitar solos going off at the same time. Right. They're completely crossed and go out of tune. It's genius, but it, it's a, we're out in the woods and the living is reaped. Load, cock, shoot, slay and eat. So we <laughs> have this... <laughs> Happiness this, is a warm gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we had this track on repeat every day for a, a week, and we, so we wrote back to our record label, Gig Records, in New Jersey. And this, you know, it's before we've all got smartphones. And we said to our friend Dave Smith that ran the office, "You've got to track down this maniac called Sport Murphy. We have to know more about it." So he does. And it, uh, Mike is an independent artist living in um, New York. And um, we couldn't believe it. We're like, you, we, we'll find him. We, when we get to New York, we've got to meet him. We have elevated him to a sort of David Bowie-esque type status while he'd been sitting in the van listening to his track over and over again. So we met Mike at the end of the tour. He came to see us. We all piled up. He bought us copies of his, his records that he'd done. And uh, a friendship was struck up. And about five years into that friendship, he gave me this, my, my very first and still my very only very jiggler and the story <laughs> and um and it, it came up last week because sport murphy's now got an amazing podcast called buckaroo holiday and it's available on uh, podbean which and he describes it as exploring the universe of music from a backyard shed bar with erudite blather sonic novelties and the occasional cocktail recipe. So he's, he's still a god to us. And, uh, but yeah, that came up and he's, he's, been in, uh, he's been in the drawer next to my bed for, well, 20 odd years, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and now's his moment. Now's his moment. Ooh. Have you still got any old records that you first bought? Have you got anything like that? You keep stuff like that. Well, I... I held on to the vinyl as long as I could, <laughs> um, simply because my house is small and it was taking over an area. Um, and then about four and a half years ago, my elder brother, Russ, he bought a, a secondhand record shop in Shrewsbury. It had been there for years, it wasn't doing very well, and the guy decided to sell it. And my brother had uh, been recently made redundant. So he emails me and goes, um, well, I've got my redundancy, redundancy money and I'm going to buy a record shop. I'm like, you're fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just nearly five years. What? And the record industry's on its ass and you're buying a record shop. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Terrible so, business plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he's made a great success of it. He, he, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, so what I did was I went through, I maybe had uh, only about a thousand, nothing to what you guys have got. About a thousand uh, albums, 12 inch singles and the like. And, and I kept the ones that really mean something to me. Uh, and I gave the rest to Ross for his stock to sell. Um, I'm slightly regretting that now. Yes. Um, because I, I, I do have afternoons where I was like, ah, oh, what was the one I thought I had the other day? I think it was like Second Hand Daylight by Magazine. I thought, oh, I'd love to hear that. Get close to, ah, damn it, I haven't got it. Um, but this are, one, are you sure? Because I, I, sorry, I've always got a theory that records, there are certain records you're never supposed to be parted from. And yeah. so when you think, oh, I let that go years ago, and you go looking, you find you didn't let it go. It's okay. magically stayed <laughs> there. I, I've had this experience. So maybe if you keep looking, you'll find Second Hand Daylight. But anyway, go on, carry on. Sorry, I got okay. across. It. That's all right. That's, so this one. Obviously, All right, okay, yeah. Me, yeah. my age, this is 
this is the only record that I have that's still in a, a vinyl sleeve that it, it would have gone into. Now, not only is it to me the greatest rock and roll record ever made, it, um, it was given to me as a Christmas present, uh, the year of its release, by my dad. So I was <laughs> 11 years old. Your dad bought it for you. That is an extraordinary bit of parenting, isn't it? Did we, have the, we had this with somebody else the other day that we talked to, Mark. Who was it that said, my mother bought me some kind of rock and roll record? I can't remember what it was anyway. Sorry. Oh, yeah. God. Uh -huh. yeah, it was, was it Henry Priestman? I think it might it have been. It might have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Henry. Anyway, sorry. Carry on. Yeah. Okay, so 11-year-old me gets that. On Christmas Day, of course, me and my brother had already got an interest in the Pistols. I think my brother had got the singles. Um, so, eleven years old, he gave me that, and he and he gave it to me as I'm opening it. It's very excited. He he said to me, and it's always stayed with me. Um, he said, "Pay attention to what this young man has to say. He might just be your Bob Dylan." <laughs> it's just it's just the most brilliant thing anyone could ever have said to me. So. About three years ago, uh, I got asked to open acoustically for Public Image Limited on a UK tour. Um, I'd met Lydon once before. Uh, we were both pretty lit up, so n n no sort of serious conversation went on. But uh, so I was on the road with them for a week or so, uh, about three years ago, and um, Lydon's manager, uh, Rambo, had said to me each day, John wants to see you. And I said, please, please, I've met John before. You know, John had got his wife on the road with him. He was very ill. And yeah, you could see he got a lot of concerns other than the tour and especially other than meeting me. And I, I, said, to, I said, every day I'd say to Rambo, please don't trouble him. Don't trouble him on my behalf. Let the guy get on with his tour. Anyway, so the one night we're, we're in Glasgow and uh, I'd gone out for a couple of drinks with some friends after the pill show and I'm wandering past the venue on my own going to um going to my hotel and rambo appears in the street and he goes john wants to see you now and i'm like oh, okay um so we go back into the venue and we go into the public image limited dressing room and rambo opens the door and i can see nora Lydon lying out on the couch and i can see the back of john and he's i don't know he's messing around in the back and rambo goes i'm gonna i'm gonna expletives okay here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So uh, Rambo goes, John, I've got someone to see you. And without looking round, Lydon goes, what cunt have you bought in here now? <laughs> I'm like, really, really, I, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And anyway, Lydon looks around and stands up and, my love! That's a very accurate impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple of drinks and, uh, and, and, and it comes to one of those sort of awkward causes. Uh, and, and we're sort of staring at each other. And, and, and to me, Lydon has this very, like a kind uncle look in his eye. Um, yeah, it's probably not, not many people will tell you that, but I find him to be very, there's a, there's a genuine kindness about him that really, you know, you really feel. So we're sort of staring at each other in this pause and he's smiling at me and I'm, just, uh, and, and he just goes, what? I said, oh, Christ. I said, it's just weird standing here with you. You know, you've you meant the world to me my entire life. And uh, I said, can I tell you something that my dad said to me when he gave me Nevermind the Bollocks when I was 11 years old? And I told him the Dylan line. And Lydon just goes, 11, that's when they get them, when their minds are valuable. <laughs> <laughs> So it was fantastic yeah. to be able to tell him that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love the way that you kept your Sex Pistols record in, like you said, in a plastic um, plastic sleeve, which is mm -hmm. it's very on-punk attitude. You know, did you think, yeah. you know, i better keep this. You know, I don't want to get stains on it. I don't want to get cider <laughs> left That's right. like that. Because it might I've be got... worth something someday. Well, there's something else very on-punk about this coffee, right? Um, as many of us will know, it's not in a side one and two order. The, no, the, no, no. the titles are just scattered on there. Yeah, yeah. So I had my brother write. <laughs> oh. so my brother would have been about 13 or 14, and he wrote the track listing out correctly for me. So that, oh, that's not very, very that's brilliant. Not very punk. <laughs> which also I'm, brings. Go on, punk. carry on. Carry on, carry okay. on. 
so this also brings me to a, another line oh, right, okay, yeah, the metal yeah. box, and something extremely on punk about this the advert that appeared in the NME and the Melody Maker full page ad for this had all the lyrics um, to, to all the tracks. Now, rather than just rip the page out of the NME and keep it in my metal box, I copied them all out yeah, 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 yeah. in a little booklet stapled together all underlined and uh and, and i've kept that so my what's that 1979 so my 12 13 year old hand did that so i you do see keep. I, I think this whole thing's interesting we've had the odd case of this in the people we've been talking to over the last few weeks and uh and lots of people who kept exercise books of, you know, of their pop, their pop passions, you know what I mean? And, and, what you, and it easily gets forgotten that what this stuff did in people's lives was it, it, it filled the space that had previously been occupied by drawing spitfires and, you know, the, all, all the things that little boys did in the back of exercise books, you know? Yeah. That's absolutely right, because you were simply trans from one hobby to another. You really you? were. A, another kind of, a, you might have been a bird spotter or a train spotter. Suddenly you, you transferred that kind of collection thing to, to um, indie music or whatever. You know, cat cataloging and keeping, you know, records yeah. of every record you bought, you know. Well, the, th the thing is with our family, I mean, I skipped, you know, Sky Electric, Sabutio. I just went straight to, to, to music and record collecting. Primarily, well, of course, my dad, giving me never mind the bollocks when I was 11 had obviously had a big impact on me. But uh, prior to that, uh, my uncle Bill, my dad's brother, was the keyboard player was in the Wizards. yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the, the Electric Light Quartet Orchestra's first two albums. And, and then he was in a late lineup of the move as well before that. So what we, so 1972, I think Ballpark Incident comes out and Uncle Bill's on top of the pops and I'm only six, you know, so it just, it just went straight to music for me. Right, right. So I, I don't suppose he was ever um, a member of VLO who got his picture drawn by Andrew Collins, who was our guest yesterday. And, and Andrew, Andrew used to practice illustrating on, on ELO. He used to be able to draw all of ELO, which I claimed ought to be impossible because they were all <laughs> hidden behind beards no, and glasses. No know? one has the faintest <laughs> idea what any of them look like, but they've now been immortalised <laughs> by Andrew Collins. <laughs> This You're sort of right. 11-year-old Andrew could do it. It's extraordinary. It's, it's in, isn't it interesting with your metal box thing? There, just hold that out, the, the pill metal box. That on those rare occasions when people depart from the basic idea of an LP record, which is, you know, paper and so forth, it never lasted as well as that did. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you, you look as if... That looks as if... It, uh, with the you know with all due respect it looks as if it's ready for chucking out you know what i mean whereas you would have thought something made in metal would never look like that but the record just kind of maintains yeah. youth doesn't it it really does yeah i don't know maybe i need to get some brasso or something there's there was, there was there a great the piece in the enemy at the time about how people were using that tin to bake things in do you remember that <laughs> People were making kind of quiches and they came out with a public image logo actually on the bottom. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is embossed. You could at least yeah. do, uh, I don't know, you could do a very, very shallow omelette with the pill logo on it. <laughs> Pizza. There's probably, yeah. there's probably somewhere on YouTube where somebody has done a clip about how to restore your copy of uh, public images metal box you know I'll they, bet they, they have yeah they show you how to do everything else they, they'll uh, they'll probably do that have you got anything else to show us yeah okay so on the family tip um so my uncle bill um my dad's brother uh, their mother gave me this it's a horseshoe brooch and she gave me this during a sound check at, a wonder, at the Wonder Stuff's, at the time, biggest ever show we'd done in hometowns. So it was 1990 at Aston Villa Leisure Centre. And um, she came to the sound check. She might have stayed to the gig. She came to a lot of Wonder Stuff gigs, even in her 80s, you know. In fact, she, she once came to a really rough little club in Philadelphia because we've got a, her sister moved to America after the second world war so she would often be in america my name was but anyway this was given to me 
uh, in 1990s. But good luck for my, at that time, my biggest ever hometown show. And uh, the history of it is that my parents had bought it for her in 1963 for her 25th wedding anniversary. And I've, oh, that also has always been, it's right next to the Berry Jiggler <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my bedside, uh, bedside table. Yeah. So it was nice to find that as well. And I, it doesn't come out often. But again, me being me, you know, in 1990, I wrote a little piece of paper what it's what it is. And oh, also really? a, oh, oh nice. well, God. Yeah, well, you've got yeah. any more old records there? I have got more old records. OK. Yeah, again, the family tip. But um, this. Oh, the front line. Yeah. 59p. Is that all it was? 59p, I think it was. I'm sure somebody will be watching and can correct me if I'm wrong. It was Virgin. It was, a, it was a budget sample. I think I've even got a copy myself with the 59p sticker on it. Anyway, sorry, carry on. Okay, no, no, that's interesting. Well, this was my dad's. This, this was, my dad bought this. So what is it, 1976? Oh, well, that yeah. kind of killed the story that I thought. I oh, thought... sorry. <laughs> Well, I've spoiled your story. Sorry. I no, no, no. It's me spotting the year. I thought this was 78 because I'm sure I'd read somewhere that when the Pistols split up and Leiden got back from the US, that Branson, this, this bit's true, Branson sent him uh, to Jamaica. Yes, he did. He did. Yeah. He did. And, and Vivian, Goldman went with, Vivian Goldman went yeah. with him, wrote a piece about it in The piece Enemy. The enemy. Yeah. It was, oh, okay. he, 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 so he was kind of he was a de facto kind of A&R man for Virgin, wasn't he? It was used as a way to kind of foreground that their, their kind of excursions into reggae, which came out dry. Yeah. Away. Well, I thought that um, Leiden had a hand in this, but not he, he might have like, done. He might have done. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But, uh, but it, it, it's, it's given, it's really, I love a lot of reggae. I don't like, I don't like reggae with drum machines. And synthesizers. No, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. I'm completely with you. It's wrong. It, really? yeah, it is it's wrong. wrong. It's wrong. If it's too regular, it's wrong. You know, exactly. I mean? it's all about the human feel. It is, of, it of is. the interaction, yeah. changing speed and time, and everything. Yeah. Exactly. Well, they always they always used to say that with reggae, the the genesis of reggae was the um, mishearing the uh, New Orleans music coming across the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> You know, that, that it would be slurred and so forth, coming through okay. the, uh, the ionosphere. Is that what we call it? You uh, can call it whatever you like. I'll go with it. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a lovely thing. That's a it's lovely beautiful thing. because it, it really, it, because um, being from Birmingham, um, we had uh, obviously Steel Pulse, uh, which we were enormously proud of. Uh, of being from the same area. And um, there was a smaller band that uh, had, had a 12 inch called Weapon of Peace was the name of the band. All right, yes. And there was a song called Children of Today. And they were another, you know, maybe eight or 10 piece reggae band from the Hansworth area. And that's really my kind of reggae. You know, on here you've got Mighty Diamonds, Delroy Washington. And I had it actually, it, it's so melodic. It's so beautifully melodic. And in the case of um, Steel Pulse, the way that the backing vocals are arranged it's, it's just gorgeous. It, it, the only other person that I think arranged their backing vocals so cleverly um, was Prince, where, so Steel Pulse and Prince share this habit of whatever the line is that needs the backing vocal on. They don't put it on the line. They don't put it after. They precede the lead, lead vocal line, which I've always found really interesting. And, uh, and don't mind admitting that Mal Patrice, the Wonder Stuff's guitarist, and I have nicked that right. little trick a few times. <laughs> yeah, I, I, had, um, I had a great conversation with, um, he's a, a rock photographer called Tony Bartolo. Um, I used to, he used to do a lot of uh, work for record collector and stuff. And uh, I became friends with him about 15 years ago. And we used to hang out outside a, a barbershop on Water Street for reasons you don't need to know about. And uh, and just talk, you know, that kind of teenage male, what's the greatest this, what's the greatest that, record bullshit. And and Tony said to me the one day, who is the greatest British male vocalist? And I'm like, well, Bowie, you know, for my take. No, 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 mate, too easy, too easy. And I'm like, 
Uh, okay, again, for my taste, Ian McCulloch, have echo anybody, man. Yeah, that's a nice shot. No, I'll tell you who it is, mate. <laughs> I love the way there's goes, a right answer here. Yeah, there's yeah. got to be a right answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you know Tony, Nice try, okay. but I think yeah. you're fine. <laughs> but he said, and I couldn't, I absolutely couldn't disagree with him, but I couldn't have been more surprised. He, he said, David Hines. And I'm like, oh, David from Hines, Steel Pulse, a Steel yeah. Pulse. And I'm like, you know what? I think you're right. And uh, yeah, great love. Of uh, Steel Pulse. Would you want to so, another record? Or? Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. wasn't Mark Ellen? Wasn't Mark Ellen your first trip overseas with a band? Wasn't God, that? Dave, was you've got a very Pulse. good, very good memory. It was Steel Pulse in? Uh, oh. Yeah, it was in Berlin. I went. I went oh. through Checkpoint Charlie with with Steel Pulse in whatever when, it would have been, 1978. When it still it. was. When Checkpoint. it was Checkpoint Charlie, and we stood yeah. in East Berlin, uh, you know, and uh, it was behind the wall. And pretty, oh. a pretty exotic bunch of people to be with, actually. And they were, yeah, they were supporting. Oh, I think they were supported by. I think they've been supported by the police. So it was a okay. pretty extraordinary tour. But they were amazing guys oh. and incredibly religious. And on the tour bus, slightly disappointingly for me, uh, <laughs> rather than lighting up enormous bifters and smoking marijuana and having a hell of a time, they read the Bible. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they read the Bible, and then we went to a restaurant, and we had to go and leave this restaurant because they discovered that at some stage, um, you know, non-vegetarian cuisine had been prepared there. Oh, wow. In the past. In the past. So they were very, very devout. God, people. that's very advanced for yeah, what? When was that? 1978, I think. Or 70, 78. 78, early yeah. 70s. Good grief. They were amazing. They were, I thought yeah. those records, Handsworth Revolution, absolutely incredible. Good yeah, and, the, and those beautiful songs. Yeah. The, the vocal <laughs> arrangement was a stolen oh, touching, you're right. Incredible. I mean, the second album as well, Tribute to the Martyrs, they, they to the really Martyrs take that. Yeah, the, vo the vocal arrangements are, are absurd. But again, they find success on, on those sort of summer sun splash tours. And the last time I saw them live, um, I think there were like four of them on stage. David Hines had got one of those guitars with no headstock on. Ugh. Oh, it's uh, a wrong, yeah. wrong, again. Oh, wrong, wrong, absolutely wrong. wrong. Yeah, there was no Hammond organ. It was all synthesizers. And worst of all, there was a drummer. But it was like a Simmons kit. It was an electronic uh, kit. Uh, and I'm just, oh, oh my oh, god! Dear. His hair was fantastic, wasn't it? Darling? Oh yes, Marvelous great, hair. great kind of pillar of dreads. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. tower of Babel. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I, I think it, I think it's so interesting what you say about guitars with no headstock, and uh, you know, and I'm no muso at all, but they, I can remember that period. I suppose in the early '80s when it was briefly fashionable. I went yeah. to see Spandau Ballet, I think it was, when they were just breaking through. And they had that kind of stuff. And you thought, it just looked wrong. For the same yeah. reasons that it would have looked wrong in the early 60s, because you used to draw guys in bands with guitars. And it had to look a certain way. It was the exactly. important part of the, uh, of the whole deal, wasn't it? You can't monkey around with that, can you? No. There are no. no there are no advances, are there, in musical equipment that, that increase the excitement for the audience, are there? No, uh, no not, in, not in terms of, of instruments, I don't think. I mean, uh, but, you know, it's like, like the keytar, which is I was going to say the keytar. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute low up. point. <laughs> Complete low point. But I think it was invented because piano players were so frustrated by the fact that they couldn't move around the stage, that they were rooted to the spot. And therefore, this was their way of, of getting a bit of the limelight. But basically, the kind of looking ridiculous. I mean, yeah. apart, from, apart from all the stuff that might be going on behind the scenes, I mean, the basic equipment setup of a band yeah. has not moved on since the animals in 1964, really. You know what I mean? It's a guitar, it's a bass, it's a singer, it's a keyboard, it's, it's drums. Yeah, you, yeah. you can make them better, un undoubtedly. You can have all kinds of jiggery pokery going on in the background, but that's what people want to see. Yeah, They're yeah. And it, going, and, oh, and I you wish know, there was a trumpeter on this stage or anything like that, are they? You know. Well, I, I think well, and what's amazing about that setup that you just described, it, it's the humanity of how, how that setup. Um, you know, you know have, so you can have, for instance, that exact same setup and have something as wonderfully melodic as Steel Pulse, or you can have Napalm Death. It's the same setup, yes, it is. <laughs> you know, but it, it's the humanity that makes the difference. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so uh, do you want another record, or do you want to? Yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, go on. Okay, I, I wanted to get this one in because. Uh, oh, so oh great. now which great. one is that? Is that chalk marks in a rainstorm? 
It certainly is, sir. Right. Okay. Yes. So I, I got into Joni Mitchell when I left home when I was 18 and shared a flat with my mate. One, one of the regular visitors around to the flat was a guy called Dan Cummins, who later went on to be a teacher, but definitely uh, used his teaching role with me by giving me a bunch of cassettes of Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen. And um, I, the only thing I knew about Joni Mitchell was probably Big Yellow Taxi because it was on the radio. And you two might have had a hand in this, actually. Um, my brother used to take the old grey whistle test on, on his uh, Betamax machine. Uh, and we were hoping for sort of punk and new wave most of the time. But I think this is when you two were doing it. Um, there was a Joni Mitchell. I'm not sure it was a live performance. Maybe it was. But, um, but the song Chinese Cafe from Hyera. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Was on there. Because I... You know, I, I would watch the whole tape open for, you know, XTC or something. <laughs> I got to really love this Chinese cafe song. So that was all I really knew about Joni Mitchell until Dan Cummins, my mate who used to visit the flat, gave me uh, a cassette of Blue and Clouds when I was 18. And I just fell in love with it and bought the other records, probably up until the Hissiners, Summer Lawns. And then, of course, what we were just talking about, <laughs> the awful advances that were made uh, with technology such as guitars and, and, and the like and 80s production which yeah. this very much is the 88 86 something like that yeah yeah but so i bought this around that time so i'm probably about 20 when i buy this and i just despised it <laughs> because of the production and not least of all dancing clown Featuring Billy Idol. Oh, right, God, yes. You know, but in fairness, in fairness, it is the low point, the lowest point in both of their careers. It's <laughs> 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 horrendous. That does sound like a desperate crossover yeah. maneuver, doesn't it? Terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But, um, but of course, about five or six years ago, I started really getting into... 80s production oh, right. <laughs> just because i so despise 2000 teens production the compression and all oh, right like, right so now it's record. now it suddenly sounds really organic really, oh, yeah okay yeah. yes <laughs> woody, I, I know woody and acoustic woody. Yes, like, <laughs> it suddenly sounds Especially like the band's young second Harvest. album <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm sure yeah. that's true oh. That's funny. So you're ahead of the curve when it comes to rehabilitating 80s. Play. <laughs> so you could write the book about, you know, the golden year of popular music is 1985 or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, the, it's the Bill Collins drum sound. It's all that. <laughs> you know. Which I've also only recently got into. You know, if you'd have told me 10 years ago, I would enjoy listening to solo Phil Collins records. They're good uh, records. They're good. Well, they they're they become good. incredibly hip now, haven't they? Those first yeah. at the time, kind of laughable. Really good. Yeah, records. they're great records. Yeah, they're really. He, he can write songs, you know, and he's, he's so, really yeah. good singer. And I, I love those records. I love them. So look, Miles, it's been an absolute delight, a joy, <laughs> talking to you. What are you doing Thanks for the rest? What are you doing for the rest of the day? You're going down, well, to the, going down to the campsite to see what they've got in. <laughs> no, I did that. I did that this morning. Actually, yeah, right. we started. Um, now today is a great day for me because um, one of the guys that I'm working with um, writing the, the the demos. Oh, I should quickly mention I have this thing called Miles Hunt's Lockdown Demo Society. It's on Bandcamp, and you subscribe to it. And what I'm doing is um, I'm putting up all the demos that I'm working on currently. So there are two streams um, of the demos. There's the, my other band, Vent 414. We're reforming. Uh, it's, a three, it's a rocking little three-piece that I had in the mid-90s. Uh, we haven't played together since 96, but we've decided to do it again. So uh, between myself and Morgan Nichols, our bass player, uh, we're sending each other demos for songs to work on when we're finally allowed to go into studios. And then the other stream is with my friend Luke Johnson. And uh, I mentioned it before, um, he's in a band called Low Lives. He lives out in Arizona and he does all the drum, program, cram, drum programming for me. Uh, and then for the vent material. But then he started, look, I've got all these instrumentals. Uh, he sings really well, but he's like, I just can't, you know, I've worked on these instrumentals and I can't find a way in vocally. 
do you want to have a bash at him? So we've, we're at five tracks now. Um, and he's in Arizona and you're in Shropshire. Exactly. So it's a love for both of us. It works out really well because when I get up in the morning, he's, he's sending done something. me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this afternoon, I've got to put some vocals on, some stuff, and okay, some mixes. And uh, yeah, so every, every day is, is actually uh, more productive than I usually am when I'm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been lovely talking to you. And, a joint tour too. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll hope to see each other on the other side, as we say. Definitely. Definitely. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you.